38, a New York City newsstand. There was Superman. Action Comics number one. Overnight sensation followed quickly by Batman. The Flash. And Hawkman. Drawn by a young cartoonist named Joe Huber. 20 years later, he returns to his best creation and enters his mature phase on characters like Sergeant Rock, World War II Ace. Enemy Ace, World War I flying ace for the Germans. Ragman, the definitive Tarzan. Characters of biblical proportions. Ladies and gentlemen, I am proud to present the work of the one, the only, Joe Cuber, and the five definitive characters that he was the definitive delineator of. I took from this autobiographical comic he did in 1968. There's his wife and children in the top panel. There's the drawing board in the bottom left. It was part of a 25 cent annual that new publisher Carmen Infantino initiated called DC Special. And it was an overview of Kubert's career to date in 1968. He started as a teenager drawing for DC Comics in the early 40s. You see some of the characters there he worked on. Then, of course, other superheroic characters, most notably Hawkman, Wildcat, The Flash. They were all teamed up together in the Justice Society of America, whose character, Hawkman, as you can see by this cover, was one of the most popular characters. And that's where a young, barely out of his teenage years, Joe Kubert made his bones. You can see here his early, more crude style by the late 40s. Of course, in the 1950s, it was the age of space, technology, the car, forward movement. And after the superheroes of the 1940s, like the Flash, died out, somebody at DC decided in 1956 to update their 1940s Flash for a new era. And Carmen Fatina was pulled in and that's where you get the beginning of the Silver Age of comics with the Silver Age Flash in 1956. Of course, Joe Kubert is known for having inked Carmen Infantino's pencils on that landmark first issue. The Flash was a success in 1956, followed closely by, well, if it worked for The Flash, let's do it for Green Lantern. So you can see the 1940s Green Lantern with the old style of baggy magician-like costumes and then the sleek late 50s, early 60s skin tight outfit Bill Kane put him in. Then the Atom was next. In the 40s, he was only called the Atom because he was a short guy with terrific strength. But Bill Kane again gave him a sleek outfit and modeled him with a more science fiction based origin for the 1960s. And just like in the 40s, all the DC superheroes banded together to form the Justice Society, so too did Julius Schwartz, the editor, bring them all together in the Justice League of America. So with all these new DC techno heroes of success, it seemed like the next one up would be Hawkman, who by the time Kubert stopped drawing him in the early 50s, had lost the wings on his helmet and even the hawk nose, and other than the wings, had become more of a standard superhero. But during the 50s, after the superhero died, Hubert made a name for himself with his Tarzan-like character, Tor, which gave him more of a savage look and brought out his more mature style. He went to DC in the later 50s and started drawing this character, Viking Prince, who again brought out the more savage style of Hubert, which he brought in this initial character sketch to his designs for Hawkman and Hawkgirl. And you can see in this Viking Prince cover, when we move in close up, you can see how that energy transferred to his new Hawkman. Here's the black and white original art to issue number one. Starting with issue two, it was one great issue after another where Kubert, ever the graphic stylist, came up with a new unique way to show a shadow character 
with his second Hawkman appearance. Here's the third one. And of course, flying and designing his panels to reflect that, he started to use more vertical panels. This is where the mature Joe Kubert style starts to emerge in the early 60s with panels overlaid a more bigger, a, a, a larger background panel to get across that feeling of space and movement. Look at this original art and how it became this cover. This was a year later, they decided to give Hawkman his wings on his helmet, so you could see how his appearance changed, and you could also see, again, the deep space that Hubert started to bring to his pages that we'll see later in his Enemy Ace World War I work. But here, it's on display in Hawkman. My favorite cover were these early 60s wash covers that DC Colors Jack Adler would render over the penciler's pencils. After this issue in 1962, Kubert never drew a full-length Hawkman story ever again. When they gave Hawkman his own title, the great DC Silver Age artist Murphy Anderson took it over, and while this Hawkman many people love, kind of like the equivalent of John Romita's Spider-Man, there's still something about whenever Kubert would stop and draw Hawkman, like later in the 60s, he showed that he owned that character. When they teamed up Adam and Hawkman because of low sales and put him in the, in the same book, Kubert brought back the uh, Gentleman Ghost, who was a character from the 1940s. And you can see the way the character was used again. I love these examples of original art. God bless the internet now you can find and create transitions like this. And over the rest of the 60s and the 70s, whenever DC Comics would need a piece of Hawkman art, invariably, Hubert would stop and do it. Sometimes he would go back and do the Golden Age Hawkman where he got his first start. This is a famous full page illustration that appeared in black and white in Jim Serango's History of Comics. Even when Hubert would do a one-off cover like Just Leave America because Hawkman was featured, even this statue of Hawkman, this pillar of salt, very biblical, still has the imprimatur of Hubert as only Hubert can do Hawkman. Here's a team up in the 1970s where Hubert would draw very little known handful of times that he drew Superman. One of the main times he drew Superman that most people don't realize is that he was the original artist in 1976 for the Superman Muhammad Ali team up, but the Ali people didn't like the fact that Hubert's people weren't photorealistic and didn't really look like Muhammad Ali. So here we see the black and white inked art of Neil Adams, who took the project over, but maintained Hubert's strong layout. And here's the finished color version as well. Also in the 70s, again, Hubert every now and then would stop and do Hawkman and put his stamp on it. His layouts, again, whenever he drew Hawkman, were open and airy and vertical to get across the feeling of flying and movement. You can see the pure joy Kubert had when he would draw Hawkman in positions like this, showing how much in love Hawkman was with flying itself. One of my favorite images, a uh, color for comic book marketplace in 1996. And this type of look, the black ink on the uh, darker paper with white highlights, Kubert returned to literally right before he passed away in 2012. He worked on this book, Joe Kubert Presents, and it, the first issue featured his return to Hawkman and Hawkgirl, and you can see the layouts that he was doing at the very end of his life were beautiful, were just as open and airy as those first few pages that I showed you. And that's why Hawkman is one of Kubert's five definitive comic book characters. Of course, the center character there, the one that Kubert is most acknowledged for, is Sergeant Rock, who I based my cover for in this uh, comic book creator magazine, the second issue being a Joe Kubert memorial issue. Kubert, of all those World War II characters that he always did covers for and sometimes interiors, is the one he's most known for is Sergeant Rock, the World War II Sergeant, not Pharrell. Rock got started in that comic book, originally it was called Our Army at War, in 1959, 
it, uh, Cupid didn't even draw the cover. I believe this is an Herb Nova cover. But the lead story was called The Rock and the Wall. And it's about a particularly tough World War II sergeant. And they say, why do they call the Sarge Rock? Because that's what he is. Because when the going gets so rugged that only a rock can stand, he stands. And at the end of the story, why do they call him the Rock of Easy? Because a wall may fall, Buster, but not a rock. You can see how Hubert developed his look over the next couple of years to the more familiar Clint Eastwood-like appearance that he seems to have. Obviously, he's pre-Clint Eastwood. There's the cover that I took that image from. And if you look at this double-page spread from my book, The Silver Age of Comic Book Art, which is out of print, but you can still get on Amazon, this was a spread for my Cuber chapter. You can see how I used that cover on the upper left and how I tried to pick all classic images that got across what Sergeant Rock was about. And mostly what Rock was about was about the hellishness of war and the toll that it took on a human being. And you can see it as the 60s developed. This is a cover from 1965. Flash forward to 1968, and here's a cover right at the beginning of the height of Vietnam War protests. And I asked Joe when I interviewed him in 03 for my book, you can't tell me this isn't your veiled, yours and right of Canada's veiled attempt at uh, protesting the Vietnam War in the same way that MASH took place in the Korean War, but coming out in 1970 was actually a World War and a Vietnam War diatribe. And Hubert said, no, Arlen, believe me, we were just saying war is hell. But I'd like to think, and I wrote about this in my book, that just because artists can't articulate in the moment why they did something doesn't mean that there aren't unconscious and subconscious ideas in the ether. That I cannot believe that this image appearing in 1968 was not a creation of those unconscious, subconscious forces. They would use, him and Canada would use the World War II venue like this as a story. It takes place in World War II, but it's about a hippie who doesn't want to fight and kill Germans. And he's got a guitar instead of a rifle. But of course, at the end of the story, he uses his guitar to kill the Nazis that are about to kill Rock. And they bury him at the end of the story like this. Real life events took over the strip when this is an image from the 1969 Mili Massacre, and you can see how Kaniger and Hubert worked it into a 1971 story. And it was so controversial that this was done in essentially a children's medium that it got featured in a 1971 New York Times Sunday Magazine cover story, which for its time was literally groundbreaking. As the 70s went on, and Kubert kept it wrong. He always did things graphically interesting with different color plates, like using the single monochromatic tones for those panels. You can see in the 80s, he always continued graphically experimenting, but he always did. Look at these covers from the mid-60s that treated a comic book cover almost three-dimensionally like a thick book. That was part one, and here's part two. Later on in the 80s and 90s, so many of Kubert's covers feel three-dimensional because he was constantly pushing the outside of that envelope. Into the new century, he would be called back by DC every now and then to do something. So here he's equating World War II with the current Iraq War. A couple of years before he passed away, he did a limited series about Sergeant Rock. Um, and you can see in this opening spread that even at the heightened age of his late 70s when he did this, early 80s, uh, because I think he died at 85, I'm not sure exactly, but you can see how powerful and commanding of the medium Cuber was well into his final years. But again, coming from the background that he came from, I'd like to read the words of his writer, Bob Kaniger when he kind of eulogized Kubert years before either Kaniger or Kubert passed away, when he said, from his pen came the sound and the fury, the loneliness, the silence, the exhaustion, the pity and the pitiless, the poetry and the mud, black and white more eloquent than erupting blood. It was a miracle. 
called Joe Huber. These are the words of his writer and partner and soulmate, Bob Kaniger, seen here in an in a image that Huber created for a special interview issue of the Comics Journal. And of course, Huber himself supplied the cover for his own um, biography by um, Al Dillon, uh, Bill Shelley that came out a few years ago. But any time that Huber was drawing Sergeant Rock, he was actually drawing a self-portrait and drawing himself. And there's the image that I used. That's from, I think, the 90s, 1996. And here's how I used it in the background of my five comic stars verbal visual essay. NBA starts out as a question mark in 1965 in an issue of Sergeant Rock. And when you opened it up, you saw the images of, are you kidding me, a German as a heroic, well, this is 1965, the dawn of the anti-hero in American pop culture. And you could see how Cannon and Kubert did their familiar three-panel staccato transition to get across the feeling of that World War I fighting in the air. And this is where Kubert's real mature page style comes out where you feel that sky and that depth. During the mid-60s, there was an interest in the original Red Baron, Baron von Richthofen, who you might recognize because the same year, 1965, is when Schultz started having Snoopy fight the Red Baron. So Hubert, of course, and Kaniger took that idea and gave it an utter realistic touch, creating in 1968 one of the greatest comic book covers of all time. In fact, all of the images that Hubert creates for NBAs between 68 and 70 are truly among his, the greatest images he ever produced. And you can see by these images the use of tone, the use of color. This is a double page spread from my book in which the text is Hubert talking about the art, but that image on the right, the red panel, is the size of a thumbnail that I blew up to nine inches by 13 inches. 13 inches. And you can see Kubert's use of the circular design motif as insects. Look how he has the plane as a little black silhouette up in that moon. But that shows you his command of graphic language. Look at the stylized uh, dry brush on those clouds there. And again, look at his understated use of color using the white of the paper as white light, as white heat. That's why full page images like this in their original black and white state are so gorgeous because Hubert is one of the greatest black and white chiaroscuro, black and white pencilers and inkers to make these pages just sing. All of these NMEA stories were all about duels, whether physical duels, but all between life and death, because death in the sky could happen at any moment. So sometimes Hubert drew it symbolically, like in this image of death as a warrior, and other times, very literally and realistically, like this character, that again, only Hubert can do with such menacingness if we come into a close-up. And that image is pretty scary. And that's the command that Hubert had when he drew Enemy Ace, one of the other comic stars that Hubert drew the definitive version of. Of course, we must get to Tarzan. Tarzan, one of the greatest fictional characters of the 20th century, the forerunner of so many superheroes, the influence, one of the influences on Superman. Here's a comic book price guide cover from 1975 that I've always found beautiful, especially because it's very similar to the very first edition, 1912, of Tarzan. But of course, in comics, the first Tarzan to come to mind is that of Hal Foster, the character Foster worked on before he owned his own character, Prince Valiant, of which he's most known for, in the days when Sunday pages were gigantic. But you can see that it starts out as a daily strip with the way Foster likes to divide images with text underneath. And here's how they were starting to get bound together in a book, one of the forerunners of comic books, was a bound collection 
of those Sunday comics. Then he starts doing a Sunday. But you can see how his panel style is very regimented. That's how a lot of Sunday comic strips looked back then. They kept that very rigid um, proscenium arch style grid. After Foster left Tarzan to do Prince Valiant, it was taken over by the great Bern Hogarth, who you can see in this example, brought a real visceral energy to Tarzan that just like Foster influenced a whole generation of artists in the 30s when he took over, this being one of his most famous pages. I've always found uh, um, Bern Hogarth's Tarzan to be a little too slick almost a little homoerotic, a little too preening. You can even see in these images, that kind of rubs me the wrong way. The foliage and everything is gorgeous. Another great artist that took over after Hogarth many years later was the great Russ Manning. But again, I felt his style was too slick for the raw, savage, jungle milieu of a Tarzan. These are the paperback book covers because Tarzan's been printed in so many editions. But of course, he's most uh, famous for Frank Frazetta taking a stab at Tarzan. Maybe not as well known as his Conan, but again, keeping in the lineage of the great artists that have tackled Tarzan. Of course, Hubert brought with him to Tarzan his background from his caveman tour. So it wasn't that much of a leap when in 1972, he took over Tarzan when DC acquired the rights. You can see how he paid homage to his hero, Hal Foster, because again, Kubert is from that generation where everybody was influenced by the big three realistic artists, Foster, Kniff, and Alex Raymond. But I've always felt that Kubert's style is definitive because there's something about the savageness of his pencils that only he made those marks that not only paid homage to the Foster that preceded him, but he took it onto a comic book page. And you can see how Hubert balances his drawing with his page design. Of course, here's with color added. Very similar to one of his peers, Jack Kirby. If you just look at that page and look at a famous Captain America page, you can see that both men were experts in kinetic dynamic energy. But overall, Kubert's raw savage style, those brush strokes, those pen marks, were perfect for the raw jungle milieu of Tarzan. So all facets of Tarzan's world, Kubert, I feel, was the most definitive of. He could draw any animal in action, leaping at the height of energy, of course, the, the jungle lion is the big kahuna. That's where, if you really want to throw your hat in the Tarzan ring, you got to draw a convincing lion. And Kubert did it with the best of them, if not the best of them. When he stopped drawing Tarzan for DC in 75, the license went to Marvel, and John Buscema took over. And he did a serviceable, serviceable job. But just like Frank Fazetta's Tarzan, I don't feel it's as uniquely distinguished as Kubert's is. Neil Adams, the great Neil Adams, did a series of great paperback paintings of Tarzan. But again, I'll take Kubert. And recently, IDW gave him the honor, while he was alive, of doing one of their artist editions uh, where they reprint the original art, actual size, in facsimile form. So to see these incredible double page spreads by Kubert and their raw, beautiful black and white form is tremendous. And the chance to see some of these great black and white covers that I'm showing you now, how they looked in full color, was also a treat and amazing. How you can see, obviously, how much color adds. I consider it like the flesh and blood, where the black and white art is the bone structure. This is my single favorite Huber Tarzan page. I think it encapsulates everything that Joe Kubert's style was about. You can feel that pylon being pulled out by the savageness and the looseness and the freeness of those brush strokes, those pen marks, everything about it, the way he blows up the tight, the way he adds that rough balloon outline, everything about it, I consider this page, along with Ditko's classic 
page of Spider-Man overturning machinery, I would say this is Kubert's hat into that ring. Because you could see what a deft pencil he was even in the thumbnail sketches that he did of Tarzan. So it was no wonder that in one of those treasury editions, he did the classic how to draw Tarzan. And that's because he is the definitive Tarzan image maker. There's no one else that created such a distinctive visage as Joe Kubert did for Tarzan. And that's why I chose that image to figure in the five characters verbal visual essay. The last character is an odd character, Ragman, created in the mid-70s with writer-partner Bob Kaniger. Ragman. The first issue comes out of nowhere. In those days, there was no advanced news. We saw this at the newsstand. What an interesting logo. And wait, where have we seen that face before? It's Cuber paying homage to himself when he pays homage to that classic enemy ace cover with this Ragman cover. He was called the Tattered, Tattered Damalian. And he came out of the junkyards and the rag trade of the New York City that Kaniger and Kubert both grew up in, in Brooklyn and Manhattan, schlepping literally back and forth. In the first couple issues, another artist drew it, and Kubert came in and gave the classic Ragman origin. Something to do with his father, was a junkyard dealer, and they owe money to the mob, and they get all the guys together, and they get electrocuted, but classic comic book lingo, he touches the electrician the uh, electricity, and he gets the powers kind of of a superhero. I think super strength, he couldn't fly. But basically, if you look at that bottom panel, Ragman was Cuber getting to do Batman. You know, back in 1966, when Infantino, the regular Batman artist, was busy doing promotional artwork for the TV show, Cuber was called in for a series of three covers that are either loved or disliked by Batman and Kubert fans. I happen to like them and always wished, wow, what would happen if Kubert actually drew Batman instead of those couple covers? So in 1976, if you look at these Ragman pages, you can basically see Kubert having a blast doing his take on Batman. And these pages remain some of Kubert's best action-oriented hero strips considering he didn't do a lot of costume heroes. But Ragman is it. He did one more issue that had this incredible silent story that he only tells about in pictures, and it's about grave robbers who come to get some treasure out of a buried grave. Ragman comes by, the heavenly symbolism of the angel looking over. And Kubert was a master storyteller. You don't necessarily need dialogue. But this is how Ragman lives on post Kubert at DC Comics. They've connected the connection between the Jewish tailors and being in the fashion trade, the rag trade, with their persecution in Europe during World War II. So Ragman becomes almost an avenging angel of the Holocaust that was only hinted at in Kubert's version. In fact, whenever Kubert did do his war comics, DC stayed away in the 60s and 70s from any overt imagery of the Holocaust. It wasn't until the late 70s in a title called Blitzkrieg that again, just like Enemy Ace, featured stories from the Nazis' point of view. It only lasted a couple of issues, but this is where Kubert's consciousness about his Judaism and about the Holocaust begin to appear. During the 80s, he does pro bono work for a Jewish organization in Brooklyn, and they adapt Bible, Old Testament Bible tales. Then, post Will Eisner, Kubert starts doing graphic novels in the 80s and 90s and the 21st century. Abraham Stone is a semi-autobiographical graphic novel about growing up in the New York City tenements that Kubert grew up in. Then he does a masterpiece called Yassel, totally done in black and white pencil, that surmises what if he had been left behind when he and in Poland escaped right before the Holocaust hit in 1939. So Yassel is a graphic novel that he tells from the point of view of himself as a child artist 
who, what if he had stayed behind and been trapped in the Warsaw Ghetto and fighting? And if you've never seen this graphic novel, really seek it out because the artwork is just gorgeous, reproduced totally from Hubert's uh, pencils. And in this one-off image that he did in 2007, again, you can see Hubert's consciousness about the Holocaust coming through. It also illuminated yet another autobiographical graphic novel he did called Jew Gangster, about what it was like to be a teenager growing up in the rough and tumble air, um, areas in New York City and Brooklyn where the Jewish gangs, the Jewish mafia, held control. This is where Bugsy Siegel came out of before he went out to Las Vegas. But none of this would have been possible had Kubert not been exploring these themes early on with Ragman, and that's why Ragman, for his uniqueness and for the role he plays in Kubert's career, takes that honored fifth place in my verbal visual essay. This appears in the second issue of Complex Creator magazine, which came out in the summer. That's a cover by Sergio Cariello that pays homage to one of the famous Sergeant Rock covers that equates the World War II soldier, a modern day savage, with the caveman, once again, to get across the feeling of what war is really about. But I try to equate the two in my six page verbal visual essay. Here's the opening spread, where you can see how I mixed imagery. I only had six pages, so I chose five characters, when of course Kubert has many more. But these were the five I isolated, so I decided to put um, Tarzan and Sergeant Rock on the same spread because of that cover in the lower left corner. You turn the page and you see this double page spread, and you can see how I worked in the Ragman imagery and even the Batman cover on the upper left and that classic Ragman cover in the lower right. For the last page, I took that great Hubert Hawkman and I added around it the beautiful covers that to this day are the only six full length comics of Hawkman that Hubert did and yet they remain the high watermark for the character, again, Murphy Anderson fans notwithstanding, but a make mine Hubert. And that is the uh, six page verbal visual essay that's still available, support Complex Creator Magazine, but I'd like to end on the fact that of course Hubert had more than only five definitive comic characters. In one of his last self-portraits that he did, he literally had a universe of them. Thank you very much. Oh my God, on time. I can't believe it. I could have done more. I could have done more. Shimmer. Fitting, right, for the Southern Adam. Okay, we can have the uh, lights up. And, um, I'll take, uh, since we have plenty of time, I'll take any questions or comments. Can we get the lights up? Yeah, please pray. I was so worried I was going to have too much stuff, but I'm glad because uh, that means more time for, more time for the Okay, guys, we got plenty of time, so let's start over there. Where, and just speak up, because I'm a little hard of hearing. Where at this convention can we get that issue of uh, how um, It's a tomorrow's publication. Um, you know, I just have my own copy, but it's really a... Um, hold on. I have it right here. I mean, if you don't know, John Cook did Comic Book Artist magazine from 98 to 2005. This is his new magazine. Um, there's nothing like it. I think John, I was hoping he would maybe be here, but he's probably on the floor somewhere. But um, John is the best editor and writer of comic book history. So uh, when Hubert died and John told me that he was planning a memorial, he goes, Arnold, I'll give you a page. Well, over the next couple months, I weaseled my way from one page to six pages. Had he given me 12 pages, I would have taken 12 pages. But basically, he was very generous to give me six pages because I knew that I could fill it up with how much I love Joe Kubert's artwork. And like I said, because I only had six pages and I needed a page for the cover, so to speak, I was left with five comic stars. 
So Viking Prince, Tor, Firehair, there are so many other definitive Kubrick uh, characters. But I'd like to think these five, at least for DC Comics, are the main five. Yes? Speak a little louder. Did Kubert write the Tarzan adaptation? Yes, Kubert was the writer, adapter. Um, you know, that followed the era where Infantino came in, which I'll be going into in the Infantino lecture, as an artist in charge and let artists be editors, which was, you know, that never happened in DC Comics before. And when it came time in 1972 to do Tarzan, uh, Hubert said he wanted to do it himself, and I think he's one of the few writer artists of his generation that is really respected as a writer. He's sparse, he's not flowery, but unlike some giants who maybe should go unnamed, doesn't let their bad dialogue get in the way of their great art. The initials being JK and NA, but I won't say who they are. <laughs> Whereas Kubert, I don't think his writing was ever assailed in the way those giants are. Yes? Uh, just, you were talking about uh, his black, black and white st style. Uh, I have always thought that Ditko and, and Kirby, kind of, when they drew, they kind of were thinking about the colors. They were, they were thinking about that full final product. Uh, but with like, somebody like Gene Colan or Joe Kubert, their black and white can stand on its own so well. Even the color actually, in some ways, I think they detract from their work. Uh, why, why is it in your in your work with the Silver Age artists? Wait, wait, wait. So was that a question? Sorry, was that an observation a or a question? The first thing about the coloring. Well, I, yeah. Do you think that's a valid? Do you think that's a valid distinction that some some of the artists, the Silver Age great artists, were uh, more black and white like that, and others? Well, I think what you're saying is that Kubert, and again. If, no, if I had more time, and now that I know I have more time, I'll build this in the next time I lecture on Cuba, which will be for the new school, October 28th, Ben Catcher's Comics and Picture Sort Symposium, so maybe I'll add these. But Cuba worked for color. He left space open. He knew what might look in black and white as empty and barren when Cuba would color it or indicate color. He really made great use of color. And like I tried to show in some of those examples, you know, he used monochromes, he used open space, he used the white of the page, which is, you know, a beautiful thing to know how to do, but you have to be an accomplished artist to realize when to use it and when not to use it. But your second question, something about the Silver Age? Uh, well, I, I was just thinking that, that some artists were, were better at that than others, and I was just wondering if you had any idea as to why some go down that road and some go down the other road. Was there a question there? Remember, I'm a little hard of hearing. Was there a question there? Just pass on. Okay. Security. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes. So uh, regarding okay. yeah, re <clears throat> regarding the big three uh, original uh, comic strip illustrators, Hal Foster, uh, uh, Kniff, and yeah, Raymond, yeah. yeah. Um, which do you think, uh, in the early days of DC, because lots of them had a sort of like how style um, in, in the books, but I'm just wondering which do you think that uh, Kubert drew from the most? And if well, Kubert, Kubert, Kubert mostly comes out of Foster. You know, it's funny. Murphy Anderson comes out of Alex Raymond, a little sl slicker, that feathering. So when you look at like Murphy Anderson's Hawkman versus Kubert's Hawkman, you can see. You know, even though Foster is very slick with Prince Valiant, it's that Foster Tarzan that really affected guys like Hubert and Frank Frazetta when they were young. But guys like Frazetta, I mean, you couldn't help but be influenced by all of them, the, the big three, if you were interested in realism. And you tended to, you know, go towards one artist or the other, depending on, like I said, Murphy Anderson went more Alex Raymond, whereas, you know, Hubert went more Hal Foster. Yes. Yeah. How did you get your information? I mean, you were just. I mean, clearly you did your you did research online, but it seems like the stuff you know too. Well, you know, I think I'd like to think if you grew up loving comics, and there wasn't a lot of history. I mean, God bless Jules Pfeiffer's book. God bless you know the couple things you know Sarango's volumes are still brilliant. But if you loved comics, I think you just naturally sort of 
was interested in the history. It's like loving rock and roll and, you know, knowing the history of rock and roll and blue suede shoes and all that stuff versus just whatever's current. So I think comics, people like rock and roll, were this outlaw form, so the history was always fascinating. Beyond, you know, what pendants do they use and what, you know, we want them to know that shit too. You know, that was like the holy grail when it was revealed that they use Windsor Newton Series 7 red sable brushes to dip their ink in. But then you'd be a kid, you'd go to the art supply store, you'd get that brush. Somehow the marks you made didn't look anything like the marks the pros made, even though you had the same tools. But that's like, you know, a, a Reebok making you play basketball better. It doesn't happen. But, uh, you know, I did my book, The Silver Age of Comic Art, which I have a copy to look through. Um, literally a lifetime of amassing information, obviously in the days where there was no internet and, you know, you had to get them out of fanzines and things. But, um, you know, nothing I think that I parlayed here is any big secret. I mean, it's all there. And nowadays, what's amazing with these IDW editions, you know, maybe today's current comics aren't as great as the Silver Age or whatever era was your childhood era of love and comics. But man, the, the, the reprints and the limited editions and the things, you know, we didn't have that stuff. You know, if you wanted a collection of Prince Valiant stuff in 1970, I think that's when the first collection came out. But I mean, you know, in those days you had great comics, but no source, you know, no beautiful hardcover reprints of comic strips and all stuff. Nowadays, the pendulum swung in the other direction, where you have incredible high cost, high price, you gotta save your money to buy them kind of things. But like that IDW edition of the Kubert stuff, if you're a Kubert fan, oh my God, it's, it's unbelievable. So, you know, God bless the fact that we live in a truly a golden age of old comic book reprints and comic book reprints. Anybody else? Yes? Is there anything you'd like to see uh, IDW by Cooper in particular? Any particular other runs you might want to see? Is it, say it again? Any other uh, Cooper uh, arcs or runs or what have you that you'd like to see IDW? Well, you know, it's all dependent on what they have original art for. You know, like the fire hairs are gorgeous. Um, and again, maybe uh, when I do the lecture October 28th, if you email me, arlenshrewer.com, it's all posted on my site. Um, anybody that wants, when I'm done with both lectures, I've got three beasts to hand out, business card. But, you know, I'll add a thing about fire hair and about how those pages, if they exist, and there was only a limited number of them, they would fit like a complete fire hair volume would be beautiful. On the other hand, what's really great about fire hair is the Benday old school newsprint coloring. So while I like the black and white fire hair art, to me, what really needs to be done is a giant size full color archival version reproduced right from the newsprint originals. You know, given what I just said about the archival reprints, I gotta tell you, when they reprint these old Benday newsprint comics, on this bright white paper and they change the coloring. That's not what I do. What I did in my book was I took the original Ben Day newsprint originals, I scanned them, and then I treated them like a color restorer would. Like when they go to you know clean the Sistine Chapel. I kept that newsprint look, I kept those Ben Day dots. I just made the white paper. I don't go for that yellow look because that's not what the original colorist intended. They wanted white paper. But I give it the newsprint white, and I make the black black. So if you look at any of the uh, reproductions in my book, let me find the Cubert section. You know, these repros are based on the original newsprint colorings. And I, so I recommend to people, if they're getting, you know, these Cubert comics, find most of them in readable versions in the five and ten dollar boxes and you know again this is specifically for those newsprint comics of that era invariably it's the way they were transmitted to us the readers on newsprint with those colors slightly off register but that's the beauty of them whereas the new reprints on the harsh white paper with the computer coloring they don't cut it so yeah, if you can't afford to scrounge around and find all, you know, 12 enemy aces in $10 reading copies, fine. 
I'm sure DC has to collect an NBAs, but I would not vouch for the actual re, you know, republishing of those stories if they change the coloring. Yes? Um, when you were talking about uh, the, the Hawkman panels and the panel yes. design, about being vertical for height to get a sense of flight, I'm curious, when he was doing Tarzan, he was doing almost every two and pages two and three were double page spreads. Right. Was he doing that to sort of emulate a cinematic look, or was that a specific reason that strikes me? Well, he, he, just like Jack Kirby uh, got into that thing where he would have a double page spread title image, that's kind of what Kubrick did. There were double page spreads in the rest of the book. It was only, he got into this sort of thing of having an opening like prologue, and then you would turn the page and you'd be hit with a double page spread title spread. And that's what those were. But yeah, I think the jungle was horizontal. It caused, so a lot of Kubrick pages are horizontal because that's the jungle. It's land, it's horizontal. It's the horizon line. Whereas his enemy ace books, and his Hawkman books are vertical panels to get across that. Uh, when I do my Infantino, if you stick around, um, you know, the flash panels were all about running. So they were long, low, horizontal panels. It wasn't about flying and vertical. Yes? Um, it's funny, because I give, in my mind, I give Marvel and Kirby credit for a lot of that experimentation with panels in the 60s. You yeah. Think it's more Hubert or all of them are no, no, no. You know, again, Cooper was a traditional storyteller. He didn't do flamboyant panels, but like if you saw, he was known for that staccato three-panel transition, which is really came from the writer, Bob Kaniger. He wrote that way. And everything, when you're designing anything, is in threes. You know, beginning, middle, and end. Everything is threes. So that whole way, that's really what Kubert sort of specialized in because of Kaniger. But Kubert like the Jack Kirby's and the Gil Kane's, they come from a period pre-cinematic page layout, the Neil Adams, Jim Sarango. They come from what I call the proscenium arch school of storytelling in which, like with Steve Ditko, the panels are just there, they're like a grid, it's all what's going inside the panel. But within that, Kubert did develop a look that he was able to teach to, you know, a whole generation of students. You know, that inset panel where panels are floating, like I tried to show in the beginning there. So again, for another lecture and more time, I, I can get in depth into those aspects, which, you know, should be discussed. Well, let me just say with the closing statement, the way I feel about Hubert, and to a certain degree, Infantino and all the other giants from the Silver Age, I really feel that the way we as art historians look back on the Renaissance masters of the human figure 500 years ago, like Da Vinci and Raphael and all those guys, the usual suspects. I truly believe that we have been living amongst giants of the human figure in our time, and that 500 years from now, our historians or aliens or both will be looking back on a master of the human figure like Joe Huber, who made pen marks and brush strokes God bless the sons, they're carrying on the Cuba tradition, but nobody ever made pen marks and brush strokes like Joe Hubert before, and nobody in the history of the earth is gonna make them again. Only one man made those marks. And I'd like to think that the work I'm doing, that this lecture, thank God for Lawrence Brenner videotaping it, I'd like to think that I'm doing my part to help ensure that those future historians are gonna look back and appreciate and honor Cuber and Infantino that I'm gonna do next. Like the way we look back on those Renaissance masters. They're our Renaissance masters. I'm preparing a, an eight-page uh, verbal visual essay for an upcoming issue of Roy Thomas's Alter Ego, where I compare the great fine artists with the great Silver Age artists. So I show a Michelangelo next to a Neil Adams I show the P.A. Ta with Kirby's P.A. Ta, Odin, Karen, Thor. And I know amongst our history circles that's probably blasphemous, but just like George Bush said, bring it on. <laughs> <laughs> so listen, should we just uh, launch into, I mean, you tell me, oh, we have to wait because people are actually thinking, boy, I gotta tell you guys, this is the first time in my years of lecturing at these conventions where I have room to breathe. Usually, I'm you know I'm going over, but I think this time I was so scared 
of going over that I actually edited down way beyond where I thought I needed to be. So, um, like I said, uh, if you email me or go to the site, if you're familiar with Ben Katcher's Picture Story Symposium, he has every Monday night at the New School of Parsons at 13th and 5th. I'll be, uh, I did my Infantino lecture for him back in June, and then he said, Arlen, can you come back in the fall and do Puber? So I'm doing this same lecture, but, I, but I'll have more time. I think I'll have an entire two hour evening uh, Monday the 28th of October. So anybody here that makes a mental note of that to come, I'll get to add to this Cuber show some of the things that we talked about, like the fire hair and the World War II stuff. And basically, uh, I have a whole file of you know unused Cuber that I'll be able to fill out for those two hours. So I think we're going to shift gears and talk about Hubert's. Um, Compatriot and peer, Carmine Infantino. Um, it's funny. Uh, yeah, no, I'm just going to talk about it loosely before we get going. It's interesting that Hubert would die in 2012 in August, and then Infantino would follow him this past spring. And their careers were intertwined, their styles were intertwined. You know, they both drew uh, The Flash, that very first one they collaborated on. So, you know, just like John Adams and I think Thomas Jefferson both died on July 4th, the same year, right? Who's a history buff here? Am I right? Didn't they die July 4th of all days and the same year? So, in a way, uh, Infantino and Hubert um, uh, had that sort of parallel um, history with them living and dying and working together and their careers were, were intertwined. Um, I suppose until we, uh, we wait, um, we could just, uh, hey guys, we could talk about uh, Carmen and Fantino or just, yeah, I would say if you're going to say Fantino, take a break now. If you have to. Everything work out?